Yahweh, our Elohim, has the awesome ability to take the schemes and plans of evil people, turn it around on top of their own heads, expose them as the fools that they are, and bring honor and glory to his own name in the process. I this Barry Phillips of 10-Minute Torah, day number three, the Torah portion of Vayera, which means, and I appeared. Let's go to Shemot or Exodus chapter number seven. Begin reading with verse number one. So Yahweh said to Moshe, See, I have made you an Elohim. The word Elohim meaning mighty one. I have made you a mighty one that is like a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother is your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak to Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go out of his land. But I am going to harden the heart of Pharaoh and shall increase my signs and my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. And I shall lay my hand on Mitzrayim and bring my divisions and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Mitzrayim by great judgments. And the Mitzrites shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand on Mitzrayim. And I shall bring the children of Israel out from among them. So Yah has a plan, and he knows all of the intricacies of the plan from the beginning to the end. He's already seen the end result of this. He knows exactly how it's going to work out. Moshe, Aaron, and Pharaoh do not. Now, Yah is telling his servants, I got this, and you're going to trust me, and you will see the end result. Pharaoh does not know that he is being played for a fool. Pharaoh sees himself as Ra, excuse me, the incarnate son of Ra, their sun god and their understanding. So he's not in his own estimation a mere mortal man. He believes he has an eternal destiny and that he is supreme in his power. He has people telling him this constantly, acknowledging that he's a supreme being on a frequent and regular basis, and he believes it. Now comes two regular, ordinary-looking men without pomp, without splendor, without elaborate dress, without any, any entourage of encouragers. Just two ordinary-looking men show up in his court and Yah is going to turn Moshe in his eyes and in Pharaoh's estimation into a god. And Aaron is going to become like a prophet. Now the pagans believe that they need to appease their gods. Yah has not called us to appease him, but rather obey him and serve him faithfully. When we do this with all of our heart and mind and being, He, in turn, shows his benefit to us, loves us, provides for us as a, um, he's not a despot or a tyrant demanding adherence, but rather he is our Heavenly Father encouraging us, accepting us as children, seating us at his table. It's It's a whole different scenario, completely different understanding. If the gods of the pagans were not appeased, then their wrath and destruction were easily felt. So the default demeanor of pagan gods toward the people was one of wrath and judgment, unless they were appeased by some act of blood sacrifice or food offering or some ritual to, to, um, to appease their hearts. Furthermore, uh, those that were men serving these idols, they had an estimation in some cultures that they could wrestle with the mighty one and overcome the mighty one, limit how the mighty one would respond to them and uh, gain some sense of upper hand. Again, that's all erroneous actions between Yah and his chosen people. So Pharaoh, Yah says, is going to refuse to repent. And he he says he's going to consistently harden his heart to the place that when he wants to repent, his hard heart will not allow him and Yah will not listen to him. 
This reminds me of the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, number 12. We're considering Esau, Yah says in verse number 15 through 17, See to it that no one falls short of the favor of Elohim, that no root of bitterness causes, springing up causes trouble, by which many become defiled. Lest there be anyone who whores, or a profane one like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wished to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Tears are the sometimes the last resort that we go to where as a child we plead and beg and plead and beg and when we don't get our way with Yah, we begin to weep and cry, moan and groan and uh, show a great deal of emotion. Yah does not look at, at the tears on our face or the grimace on our face, but rather he looks at the content of our heart and he knows the very inclinations and understandings of our heart and he knows when he's being played. You can't play him because he already knows. So Yah was not impressed with Esau's sense of repentance. Why was it that Yah would not allow him to repent? Well, Yeshua taught us when he taught us to pray in Matthew number chapter number 6. He says in verse number 15, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither shall your father forgive your, you your trespasses. If Esau never forgave Yaakov or Jacob, then there was no way he could be forgiven himself. But what does this chapter also teach us? In verse number 33, Yah says, Seek first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The focus for the people of Elohim is the kingdom. The kingdom. The whole agenda it's not trying to vote somebody out of office. It's not trying to overthrow local governments. We're not looking to redeem necessarily the, the nation that is host to us in our exile. We're seeking the kingdom. Yeshua said, seek his kingdom first. And Matthew 6 again, he says... This is how you are to pray. Let your kingdom come or your reign come. Let your desires be done on earth as it is in heaven. To which I often, as I pray that, add, and may it be in our day. Father, in our day, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let it come here. In praying that, then, I have to understand that the process of the answer being received is the displacement of earthly kingdoms. Moshe had to understand that a diplomatic deal was not going to be worked out between Yahweh and Pharaoh. There was no peace treaty to be signed here. Yah was going to level Mitzrayim to the ground, totally destroy and annihilate its, its systems and its structures, um, its means of support of the people, to where there would be nothing left. Unfortunately, the rabbis teach that some 80% of Am Israel still chose to remain in Mitzrayim when Yah led his divisions out. What does this tell us? When you stand against evildoers, which 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think verse 13 says that evildoers will wax worse and worse in the last days. Evil men are not going to improve. The, the, the tyrants are still going to be tyrannical. The influencers in media and, and entertainment, they're still going to be seeking to seduce and lure and cast aside our hearts after vain imaginations that they would offer to us as entertainment. So the systems of the world are going to continue. But God is going to pull the rug out from under that Turn it against their own heads. Those that are promoting an evil end result for the earth are going to be exposed as fools that they are. And then Yah is going to bring Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua our Messiah, to us with his kingdom 
and bring final resolve to the whole matter. You want to be on Messiah's side. Don't be fooled. Walk in wisdom. We win in the end. We'll build on this tomorrow. Until then, shalom.